So today we'll speak about Varaha. Ma Om Vishnu Bhadaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Shamini Tinamane Namaste Sarashati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvisesha Sanyavadi Paschatere Sutarine Banchakalpa Turubhyas Chakrapa Sindhu Vyeva Cha Patita Nam Pavane Vyo Vaishnave Vyo Namo Namaha Mukam Karoti Bhachalam Pangu Langayate Girim Yakrapa Tamaham Vande Sri Guru Dinatarina Sri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nithananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Sri Vasari Gora Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare So what I would like to do is read the verses from the Bhagavatam and some of the purports. And if I don't read the verses, I will just explain the story. I will explain the story and read the verses. I'll do both. And then I selected some portions of the purports, Srila Prabhupada's purports, and then we could speak about them and hopefully finish. I don't know if that's possible, but we will try. So. To speak about Lord Varaha, the appearance of Lord Varaha, we need to briefly speak about the fall of Jaya and Vijay. And I will only speak briefly because Lord Nishingadev's appearance day is coming up May 5th, and whoever is going to speak will probably speak about this in more detail. But to understand the story of the appearance of Lord Varaha, we first have to understand the fall of the two doorkeepers of Baikunta, Jai and Vijay. So once the four Kumaras, Sanat, you know the four Kumaras? They are Sanat Kumar, Sananda, Sanatan, and Sanaka. Correct? Yes. They are listed as one of the Mahajans, Kumara, they're known as Kumara. So the Kumaras, the four Kumaras are known as Mahajans. They're great devotees. And they, at this point in their spiritual development, were impersonalists. They acknowledged the personal form of Krishna, but they preferred a relationship of oneness. Not of service, but of oneness. But they were still attracted to Krishna and they wanted to go see him in Vaikuntha. So they entered Vaikuntha and there were six gates that they entered and no one stopped them because they were actually qualified to enter Vaikuntha. But when they came to the seventh gate, there were two gatekeepers there, Jaya and Vijay. And immediately when they, Jaya and Vijay saw them, they became upset. How did these kids get up here, they shouldn't be here. Which poses an interesting question, can you actually get into Vaikuntha if you're not allowed to be there? And I would suggest don't try, unless you know somebody there. And Srila Prabhupada said, you have to be completely Krishna conscious to go to Vaikuntha, but if you hold on to my lotus feet, I have the key to the back door and I'll let you in. So if we hold on to Prabhupada's lotus feet, maybe we could make it before we're completely qualified. But anyway, for some reason, Jayan Vijay thought that these Kumaras were not qualified. And the Kumaras thought, how could they think anybody could get into Baikuntha who isn't qualified and how dare they think we're not qualified. And so both Jai and Vijay were upset and the Kumaras were upset. And Prabhupada said that on rare occasions it's possible even to get angry in Vaikuntha. But I think the Kumaras were angry more because they felt that this was not proper. It was, it was, the Jaya and Vijaya had done something wrong. Anyway, to make a long story short, 
Jaya and Vijay wanted, uh, excuse me, the Kumaras wanted to help them, purify them, so they cursed them. They said, you don't belong here because you're acting in duality. And you're seeing us with anger and seeing that we're not qualified to be here. So, you belong in the material world and you will have to take birth as demons. And as most of you know, this was actually the desire of Krishna. Because Krishna wanted to fight. And he wanted to fight with his devotees. And he wanted his devotees to become huge demons. So, Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashibu were the first incarnations of Jaya and Vijaya. And Prabhupada said Hiranyaksha was the original demon in the material universe. As Brahma was the original Deva, Hiranyakasipu and Hiranyaksha were the original demons. So anyway, and then they took birth again and again and again in different incarnations. So, once upon a time, Hiranyaksha was doing mischief because that's what demons do, correct? We read in Bhagavad Gita, they do things which are destructive. Purposefully or unknowingly, that's what they do. But Hiranyaksha was this huge demon and for some reason he didn't like it that the earth was floating in space. So he pulled it out of orbit. It was that powerful. You imagine how powerful? He pulled the, orbit, or the earth out of orbit and sunk it to the bottom of the Garbodak Ocean. Actually, this pastime happened in different millenniums and it happened differently in different millenniums. In one millennium, it was just a partial devastation. But in another millennium, Hiranyaksha came and pulled the earth out of orbit. Somehow or other. So let's read what happened. So this begins with Lord Brahma, who is, when problems in the universe, you, you read in Srimad Bhagavatam, when there are problems, they come to Lord Brahma, because he's the ultimate authority and the most powerful person in, in this world, so the problems come to him. So now, it begins with this issue coming to Brahma's attention. And this is from the third canto, 16th chapter. This is text 16. Sri Maitreya said, Thus seeing the earth merged in the water, Brahma gave his attention for a long time how it could be lifted. Brahma thought, While I haven't been, been engaged in the process of creation, the earth has been inundated by a deluge. Of course, as I said, there are different stories, and this, this, I believe, this explanation here is when the, the time of creation, the earth went to the bottom of the Garbodak Ocean, and it's gone into the depths of the ocean. What can we do who are engaged in this matter of creation? It is best that the Almighty Lord directs us. In the purport, Prabhupada says, Sometimes when a devotee has service to do, they become perplexed. You understand the meaning of perplexed? Perplexed means bewildered. You don't know what to do. Should I do this or should I do that? Did that ever happen to you? Prabhu, I have a question. Should I do this? Because if I do this, this will happen. But if I do this, this will happen, and I don't know. So that, or, or you don't even know the choices. You can't even think of the choices. And I think Brahma's situation was a little more like that. Like just perplexed. How did the earth fall into the garbled dark ocean? And now what do we do? So Prabhupada says, even though devotees are perplexed, they are never discouraged because they have full faith in the Lord 
and he paves the way for smooth progress of the devotee's duty. It's very important that what's happening now, Lord Brahma is perplexed, but he's not discouraged because he knows he can depend on Krishna for guidance. Krishna will reveal to him how to do it. So, would you like to hear a story? This is a story about myself. It's, it's not such a great story, so I can tell it. I mean, it's not, I'm not propagating my glories. I'm not trying to. So, I had written a letter to Srila Prabhupada and I asked Prabhupada, how is it possible to remember Krishna all the time, no matter what we do? And he said, whatever you do, you should think you have no qualification to do it. Because if you think you have no qualification, you will have to pray to Krishna to give you qualification. And that way you'll always remember Krishna. As we see, when a person becomes proud, they don't think they need God because they think they can figure it out themselves. Correct? So the opposite is true. If you think you can't, you think of Krishna. So Prabhupada said, I was a temple president at that time. So he said, you should think if Krishna doesn't help you, if he doesn't give you intelligence how to run the temple, all the devotees in the temple will leave. That was all three. At that time, there were only four, and I was one of them. So that would mean all the devotees leaving met three people leaving. This was in 1970. So he said, in a sense he was saying, it doesn't matter if you're not qualified, you pray and Krishna gives qualification. So that's Brahma's position. I don't know what to do, but I know Krishna will guide me. He'll give me intelligence if I am sincere. Now just try to understand something. Those of you may not know the history, the details of the history of Iskon. This story, which I'm telling you, was a temple, one of the main temples. It was in Vancouver, Canada. That's one of the big cities of the world. This was in 1970, and there were four devotees, which was an average-sized temple. There are more devotees here in this building right now than were in the entire Hare Krishna movement in 1970. And I was put in charge of the temple. I had been a devotee eight months, and I was 20 years old. How many 20-year-olds here do we have? who have been devotees eight months, would you like to start a temple? <laughs> so that's how the movement began. Average temple president at that time may have been a devotee one year, average age probably 21, 22. What were they doing a year before that? They weren't born in Gujarat of parents who were worshipping Bal Krishna for 45 generations. We don't want to say what they were doing. You know what they were doing. And now they're running temples. How is that happening? Who's running the temple? Krishna. By giving intelligence to the sincere devotee. So I don't know what was even more perplexing, me running that temple or Brahma, wondering how to save the earth, because I didn't know how to run a temple. In fact, when the GBC dropped me off at the temple, he said, you have $500 in the bank. So in 1970, $500 was uh, two months rent, Maybe, maybe a month, enough money to run the temple for a month. But when I went to the bank, there was only $50. They missed a zero. <laughs> so there wasn't even money to pay the rent, to buy food or anything. 
So how did we do it? Krishna, help. Devotees, Prabhupada came and installed deities. Average devotee in the temple, when the deities were installed, one year. Maybe one and a half. When, in, when the deities were installed, I was just looking at the deity installation of Los Angeles. I was there. That's when I got my Brahminical initiation. I had been a devotee about eight months. So they say the average devotee is somewhere between around a year, year and a half. That's when the deities were installed. Very little experience in deity worship. In fact, we had to cook for the deities, but there was no one to teach us how to cook. And men in America don't cook. They don't learn how to cook from their mothers. And in America, because you're raised on a diet of meat, you don't know how to cook vegetables because all you do is steam them and put butter and salt and pepper. That's all you know. So we would go into the kitchen and pay obeisances on the, to the pots and the stove. And, the <laughs> and we would just say, Krishna, please guide me how to cook because we don't know how to cook. And that's how the movement started. Book distribution started that way. All the preaching programs you see now, they all started that way. Inexperienced people, both materially and spiritually, putting their hands up in the air and saying, Krishna, please guide me. I don't know how to do this. So that's what's happening here. O sinless Vidura, all of a sudden, while Brahma was engaged in thinking, a small form of a boar came out of his nostril. The measurement of the creature was not more than the other upper portion of a thumb. So, this big. How many of you think boars are beautiful? Nobody. So one of the important things to understand in this pastime is the verse from Bhagavad Gita, Janma Karma Chame Divyam Evam Yobeti Tattataha Takta Deha Puno Janma Naiti Mam Eti So Arjuna. Krishna is saying, if you understand my birth and activities in truth, Tattva, then you're liberated. So when Krishna does his Leela, this is very interesting. He comes as an, as an ugly creature, or what we think, not that Krishna's ugly, but he but he takes the form of what we know to be a very ugly animal. How many of you would like to embrace a boar? Anybody? You think they're cute? No. So as soon as we hear the word boar, we think, yuck. Ooh, a boar, right? And now Krishna's coming as a boar, but he's very beautiful. So what does that do? That causes us to understand he's not material. I was listening to a lecture just before I came by Srila Prabhupada on this verse, and he said, this boar didn't come like, a bo like we come, by force. And he didn't come to suffer. He came from his, by his own choice to enjoy. So, just like when we see Radha and Krishna, we may think boy and girl. And Krishna says, if you think boy or girl, you'll never understand me. Tattvataha. So now Krishna's helping us understand the tattva about who he is by coming as a boar and being beautiful. This boar you could embrace. Would you like to embrace Varaha Dev? Yeah, of course. Somehow or other, he was a beautiful boar. Because it's Krishna. And it's Krishna coming to show a specific aspect of who he is. To do something that he could not do as Shyam Shundar. It wouldn't make sense. I mean, of course, he lifted Govardhan, but here's the whole world. It's different. Okay. 
O descendant of Bharata, while Brahma was observing him, that boar became situated in the sky in a wonderful manifestation, as gigantic as a great elephant. Struck with wonder at observing the wonderful boar-like form in the sky, Brahma, with great brahmanas like Murichi, as well as the Kumaras and Manu, began to argue in various ways. What do you think they're arguing about? It actually meant they were discussing. They weren't having a fight. They were debating. You understand? They're discussing who he was. They're discussing who is this person? Is this some extraordinary entity come in the pretense of a boar? It is very wonderful. He has come from my nose. Now this is interesting, if you think about it. Brahma is thinking, I don't know how I'm going to solve the problem, but I know Krishna will help me solve it, and then Krishna comes out of his nose. And the boar is the one who's going to solve the problem. So if we have faith that Krishna will solve our problems, then something is going to happen. Either the idea is going to come or we're going to meet somebody who's going to help us solve our problem in some way. It will come. I was listening to a lecture last night on the way from Mayapur to Calcutta, and Prabhupada was talking about faith. And it was a very interesting discussion he was having, because devotees were asking, where does faith come from? And sometimes we hear, well, faith comes from past samskaras past piety. Sometimes we hear it comes from sangha, association with advanced devotees. Sometimes we hear it said it comes from study, understanding scripture. In this conversation, Prabhupada said no to all of those. He said, just have faith. He said, faith actually comes as a byproduct of devotional service. He said, because sevan mukhi hi jiva do swayam eva spuratyada, you only get realization through service, and service begins with the tongue, chanting and eating prasadam. He said, so when you get realization, that's where the faith will come from. So it's only by, he said, somehow or other you have to have enough faith to do bhakti, to do the service, because it's through the service that the faith will come. So basically he's saying, just have it. How do I get it? Just have it. So here we see Brahma had it. Immediately the answer came. Krishna appeared to help, to help. Has this ever happened to any of you? <clears throat> You needed help to do something, you couldn't do it, and someone helped you, or some idea. Has that ever happened? You just get on your knees, Krishna, please help me. Look at all the people that came to Srila Prabhupada to help him. If you read the Prabhupada Lila Amrita, most of those people you read about that helped him in the early days aren't even here anymore. It was like Krishna just sent them. Because Prabhupada needed so much help in the beginning. So that's faith. That if we have a problem, if we have a need, if we have faith, Krishna will fulfill it. He'll give the answer, he'll help us. So they continue their argument. First of all, this boar was seen no bigger than the tip of a thumb. And within a moment, he was large as a stone. My mind is perturbed. Is he not the Supreme Personality of Godhead? So Brahma is thinking, well, who else could he be? To, you know, he, they say big as a stone. Actually, Prabhupada said, he extended all the way to the higher planets. So you can imagine, he has to carry the earth. How big is he? What's the diameter of the earth? Who knows? How large is it? 12,000? 12,000 miles, which is what? 18,000 kilometers? Or no, no. 12,000 kilometers. 
So it's like 18, yeah, 12,000, like 12,000 kilometers. And how much does it weigh? We don't know. So anyway, he had to be big enough because he put the earth on his tusk. So his tusk must have been at least 8,000 kilometers wide. So his body must have been 8,000 kilometers more or less. If you could imagine that. So then Brahma's thinking, well, who, who else could this be? Right? Since Brahma is the supermost person in the universe, he had never before experienced such a form. He could guess that the wonderful appearance was the boar himself. Um, now, then Krishna let Brahma know that it was actually Krishna because he roared. Has anyone ever heard a boar roar? Anybody? I've never heard. Do they roar? Does anyone know? We don't know. I guess they, uh, maybe they do, maybe they don't, but Lord Varaha, they've roared. But the roaring was so beautiful, so intoxicating. Could you imagine? I mean, if Krishna sang you imagine hearing that? What would that sound like? Just can't imagine. So Brahma heard this sound and it was so beautiful. So not only beautiful, but hitting the soul, the heart, transcendentally ecstatic. He could understand this is Krishna. No one has a voice like that. Boars don't have a voice like that. So, then the sages on the higher planets, they heard, they understand this was the Vedas personified, Lord Bohr is the Vedas personified because the Vedas, the breathing of Narayana, and so the Brahma got the Vedas and then the boar came out of Brahma's nose, his breath, so this is the personified Vedas. So they chanted prayers to glorify him, the personified Vedas. So then, Lord Boar got ready to dive in the Garbhodak Ocean and because the earth was sitting at the bottom. And then this is what he did. Before entering the water to rescue the earth, Lord Bohr flew in the sky, slashing his tail. This is, you know, how long is his tail? 4,000 kilometers? His hard hair is quivering. His very glance was luminous, and he scattered the clouds in the sky with his hoofs and its glittering white tusks. So it was quite a scene. So then, he glanced at the devotee Brahmins and then he dove in the water. And then, a tsunami happened. If a 8,000 8, kilometer wide boar dives into the water from the sky, that's a problem if you live near the Garbhodak Ocean. If you have a beach house by the Garbhodak Ocean, <laughs> that's going to be a problem. Diving into the water like a giant mountain, Lord Bohr divided the middle of the ocean and two high waves appeared as the arms of the ocean, which cried loudly as if praying to the Lord, O Lord of all sacrifices, please do not cut me, give me protection. So now, Pra 
Prabhupada said, he didn't, because he's a boar, he found the earth by smell, not with his eyes. He smelt it, and he smelt it at the bottom. He went down to the bottom, and then what did he do? His tux, his sound effects. <laughs> that was going down into the water. Right? <laughs> so now we need sound effects going up. <laughs> so he put his tux, his tusks under the earth and then came up. What's the sound of that? B -b -b Bubbles or something, right? And he came up with it. Now, it said here, it doesn't talk a lot about the fight he had with Hiranyaksha. We all like to hear, especially the men, we like to hear a good fight, and it's, it's not in the Bhagavatam. Like it's only one verse or two verses. Lord Bohr very easily took the earth on his tusks and got it out of the water. Thus he appeared very splendid. Then his anger glowing like the Sudarshan, Sudarshan wheel, he immediately killed the demon Hiranyaksha, although Hiranyaksha tried to fight with the Lord. It says immediately, so it doesn't sound like they had a long fight. Thereupon, Lord Boar killed the demon within the water, just as a lion kills an elephant. The cheeks and tongues of the Lord became smeared with the blood of the demon, just as an elephant becomes reddish from digging in the purple earth. Wow. Then the Lord, playing like an elephant, suspended the earth on the edge of his curved white tusks. He assumed a bluish complexion like that of a tamal tree. And thus the sages, headed by Brahma, could understand him to be the supreme personality and offered him obeisances. And so, the next verses up to verse 42 are prayers. I'm going to skip a few verses and then Oh Lord, there is no limit. This is one of the prayers. There is no limit to your wonderful activities. Anyone who desires to know the limit of your activities is certainly nonsensical. Everyone in this world is conditioned by the power of mystic potencies. Please bestow your causeless mercy on these so conditioned souls. And Prabhupada explains, it's a very interesting point here, that Krishna, Krishna, because he's transcendental, if you try to understand him logically, he's not going to fit within your logical mind. But at the same time, Prabhupada says we should preach logically, right? And criticizes other religions that are not logical, right? But at the same time, there's a dimension or a level you come to where things become illogical. Because if you could figure out God with your mind and understand him, it would mean he's material because your mind's material, right? If a, if a mind can understand something perfectly, that means what it's understanding must not be beyond it. And it's because Krishna's beyond it, there's going to come to a point where what he does will not make sense. It's transcendental. So, this verse explains that, and Prabhupada's just making the point, there's a, there's, well, there's a nice story, I'll tell you, but, but Prabhupada's making the point, as he did with faith, there's a point you come to 
where your understanding, it just it hits the limit of what you can possibly understand with your mind intelligence. And then beyond that, you could only understand it through service. So, very nice story. There was a professor who went to see Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, Saraswati Thakur. And Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur said, at the present time I am busy, you can ask my disciples whatever questions you have. <coughs> and then you can come back to me if you need more clarification. So they, this professor went to the disciples. The disciples were engaged in cleaning the deity plates and paraphernalia. And they invited the professor to help. So that I, we can answer your questions, but we have to finish cleaning the plates. But if you like, you can help us. I guess India was a different time, or perhaps they knew the professor. Anyway, they engaged him. Actually, it was the system in Gaudiya Mat that the first service you would get would be cleaning pots. That was like, you know, you come, you're the top student in all of India, and you join Chopati Temple, and your first service will be pot cleaning. Or at least if it was a Gaudiya Mat, that's what you would do. You would clean pots for a while. Just so you understand your position, you know. So anyway, he said, okay. Um, and then after they finished, he left, didn't ask the questions. And he went to Bhakti Siddhanta and said, so, did my disciples answer your questions? He said, no, all the answers to the questions came while I was cleaning the deity paraphernalia. So in other words, there are certain things we could never, ever, 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 ever understand. <laughs> Let's try that again. There are certain things we could never, ever, ever unless we do service. Anyone who desires to know the limit of your activities is nonsensical. The Lord thus being worshipped by all the great sages touched the earth with his hooves and placed it on the water. In this manner, the Personality of Godhead, the maintainer of all living entities, raised the earth from within the water, having placed it afloat on the water. He returned to his own abode. Now, all of you who've sat here patiently get a prize. Would you like a prize? Okay, I'm going to tell you what your prize is. It's in verse 38. It's verse 48. If one hears and describes in a devotional service attitude this auspicious narration of Lord Bohr, which is worthy of description, the Lord, who is within the heart of everyone, is very pleased. Now, if you could please Krishna, what more would you want? Actually, Prabhupada said that. He said, if you can please Krishna, what else is there? Right? To know that what I've done is pleasing to Krishna. So Krishna is very pleased for all of you who've stayed awake for the last 20 minutes and didn't space out too much and heard this story. You know we're supposed to hear with rapt attention. So those of you who heard with rapt attention really please Krishna even more. Purport. In his various incarnations, the Lord appears, acts, and leaves behind him a narrative history which is as transcendental as he himself. Everyone likes to hear a wonderful narration, but most stories are not auspicious nor worth hearing because they are inferior quality of material nature. Every living entity is superior and nothing material can be auspicious for him. Intelligent persons should therefore hear and cause others to hear the narrations of the Lord's activities, for that will destroy the pangs of material existence. 
Out of his causeless mercy only, the Lord comes to this earth and leaves behind him his merciful activities so that the devotees may derive transcendental benefit. You see, we have pictures here in the temple of Krishna's pastimes. We have books about Krishna's pastimes. We have songs about Krishna's pastimes. We have poetry about Krishna's pastimes. We have dance about his pastimes. We have drama. If he didn't come, what would we talk about? You know what you would talk about. Sports, politics, Bollywood stars, latest fashion, right? We already talk about that anyway, and Krishna came, you know, but we don't talk about it as much. And some of us may not talk about it at all. But if Krishna didn't come, what will we have to talk about that's actually beneficial and relishable? In America, they have, you must have these magazines here, what do they call them? People. You have People magazine? You have People magazine. And who are the people in People magazine? I call it the Mahajans of the material world. the people who have the beautiful bodies and the beautiful faces, but their hearts may not be beautiful at all. And therefore, not really the best people to hear about if you want to uplift yourself spiritually. Correct? So, but for people in the material world, these are the Mahajans, the movie stars, the sports stars, and the politicians. Right? And the uh, music stars. We call them rock stars because rock and roll. But you don't call them? What do you call them in India? Not rock and roll because they don't play rock and roll. But the singers. You call them, What do you call them? Singers? Pop stars. Yeah, whatever. But yeah, well, yeah, yeah, pop stars. All right. So we are so fortunate. If you like to write, you can write about Krishna. If you like to paint, you can paint about Krishna. If you like to write poetry, you can write poetry. If you like to sing, you can sing about Krishna. What if Krishna didn't come? What are you going to sing about? What are you going to write about? What are you going to sing about if Krishna didn't come? Oh, baby, I love you. <laughs> if you ever leave me, I'll die. Right? I was on the plane and there was a Hindi movie. Maybe some of you have seen it. I hope not, but <laughs> if, if you have, you can help me with the storyline. But anyway, this one man was attracted to a girl and he was a... He would talk to her on the phone but the actual girl who he was, was someone he knew, but he didn't think it was her. And she was in love with him, but she couldn't tell him that she was the girl. There was some plot like that. And, and she was, he, he, as her friend, was helping, she was helping him how to get the other girl, which was actually her but he thought it was somebody else. It was, you know. So I'm watching this and I'm thinking, this is Krishna Leela, perverted. That Radha and Krishna can't get together because something's in the way. So there was something, the whole movie, there was something in the way. So when we don't have Radha, Krishna Leela, we have to watch these movies that are exact perversions of the boy and the girl can't get together because Mother Jatila the mother-in-law won't allow them to get married because he comes from this family and she comes from that family and if they get married it's going to ruin the whole family and we're never we're going to we're going to divorce you from the family and it, right isn't that the how it works now in all the movies it's a Radha Krishna Leela. It's like the Jatila's in the way and Krishna can't go out and meet Radharani then they think they they were seen together and they have to hide and 
So we have that. We don't have to watch the Bollywood movies. We have that. We're fortunate. That's why Krishna comes. He does all those things. And all those movies, if you see them, they're just taken. You know, the, in Indian culture, they're so used to this. All their Bollywood movies are so similar to the Leelas. Because we don't have movies like that in America. And when I see the Bollywood, I was like, my God, this is like so Radha Krishna, Leela. The mother-in-law is there, the mother, the brother, everybody. It's the whole family. They can't get married, you know. But they're in love and they, they go off together and the total disgrace. And Radha Krishna and Leela, you know. You know, Radharani is the ultimate chaste lady and if she's found with Krishna, it'll ruin the family. And it's So Krishna comes, so we have the real thing. And when we have the real thing, we become liberated. Evam yoveti tattva. If you know the real, the pastimes, you become liberated, Krishna says. You don't have to take birth again. Okay, it's a very nice verse. There's two more verses, and then we can take questions, I guess. Nothing remains unachieved when the Supreme Personality of Godhead is pleased with someone. By transcendental achievement, one understands everything else to be insignificant. I'll read that again. By transcendental achievement, one understands everything else to be insignificant. One who engages in transcendental loving service is elevated to the highest perfectional stage by the Lord himself, who is seated in everyone's heart. Okay, I want to ask you all to pay attention, because this is a very nice purport. I know it's difficult, difficult to control the mind, and even more difficult to hear an American speak English because you may not understand every word. Should I speak like an Indian? Would that be better? Easier to understand? So, as stated in Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> is, that, is that better? <laughs> so, so, this is a nice purport. Uh, that's all you get. <laughs> as stated in Bhagavad Gita 10.10, the Lord gives intelligence to the pure devotees so that they may be elevated to the highest perfectional stage. Now you may say, well, that doesn't apply to me because I'm not a pure devotee. Prabhupada said, all my disciples are pure devotees. Because if you follow the process of pure devotional service, you're a pure devotee. You're just a green mango. For different stages. But if we follow the process, it is pure. We're engaged in pure devotional service. It is confirmed herein that a pure devotee who constantly engages in the loving service of the Lord is awarded all knowledge necessary to reach the Supreme Personality of Godhead. For such a devotee, there is nothing valuable to be achieved but the Lord's service. If one serves faithfully, there is no possibility of frustration because the Lord himself takes charge of the devotee's advancement. You like that? If you don't remember anything else, this, this, we should remember this. If one serves faithfully, there is no possibility of frustration because the Lord himself takes charge of the devotee's advancement. The Lord is seated in everyone's heart and he knows the devotee's motive and arranges everything achievable. In other words, the pseudo-devotee, that means the pretend devotee who's pretending, who is anxious to achieve material gains cannot attain the highest perfectional stage because the Lord is in knowledge of his motive. One merely has to become sincere in his purpose and then the Lord is there to help in every way. So what this means is, it, if a devotee is sincere, it is impossible to not become Krishna conscious. 
the only reason, the only reason we cannot be, we would not or cannot become Krishna conscious is because we don't want it. That's the only reason. But if we want it, Krishna is saying here, he will give it. He'll guarantee. He, he'll, it's guaranteed he will give it. What did Prabhupada say? There is no possibility of frustration because the Lord takes charge of the devotee's advancement. So a very important point in this regard was a conversation in which a devotee asked Prabhupada an important question. The devotee said, Srila Prabhupada, what is the greatest obstacle to advancing in devotional service? Good question. How many of you think that's a good question? Would you like to know the answer? I could tell you when I come back next time on my annual 15-year return. <laughs> or I could tell you now. Would you like to hear now? <laughs> Hopefully I won't. I'll come back before 15 years, if you allow me. So Prabhupada said, You are the greatest obstacle. Now, we're going to do something at the Japa workshop. I have to give a little ad, a little plug for the workshop. We're doing um, tomorrow, and I want to inspire you to call your boss tomorrow morning and tell him you just got sick. <laughs> and you have a special disease that lasts for four days. <laughs> so you'll be back to work Friday morning. So... In the Japa workshop, we do something very interesting. We do many things very interesting. But one of the things that we discover is just how much we get in the way of our own bhakti. And we have a very interesting realization. We do an exercise. And this exercise helps us come in touch with the fears we have that if we surrender too much to Krishna, he may make our lives difficult. If I surrender to Krishna, what if? There are a lot of what ifs. And we discover the what-ifs because it's important to discover what the what-ifs are if you want to improve your japa because you're praying for pure devotion. And if you want to chant good japa, you have to get rid of all the what-ifs because you can't pray with your heart if you're reluctant. So, one of the realizations we have is that this fear is backwards. Because we're not afraid of ourselves, we're afraid of Krishna. If I surrender to Krishna, what if? But the what if is not Krishna, the what if is us. We're the ones that get in the way, right? Krishna, he doesn't, he's not going to do anything to get in the way of our happiness, our getting closer to him, our advancement. He's not going to do, we're the ones that do it, isn't it? We're so afraid if I surrender to Krishna, what if? We should, be, we should be extremely afraid of our own selves. Why are we afraid of Krishna? You think Krishna's going to hurt you? You think Krishna's vicious? If my devotee surrenders, then I'm going to make him suffer. He deserves it. No, that's not Krishna. When you surrender to Krishna, Krishna is going to expand the sweetness of the relationship. But it's actually ourselves who are causing our own suffering because of our reluctance. In the prayer Prabhupada, in a lecture Prabhupada gave on the Vyas Puja of Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, he talked about my causeless unwillingness to surrender. 
There's a conditioned unwillingness to just do it, <laughs> right? So, the only person that can ever hurt us, who could ever deviate us from the path of bhakti, is that person we look at every morning in the mirror. That's the only one. If we want Krishna, we will get him. Guaranteed. 100%. That's it. Guaranteed. And we'll read the last verse. Who other than one who is not a human being can exist in this world and not be interested in the ultimate goal of life? Who can refuse the nectar of the narr narrations about the personality of Godhead's activities, which by itself can deliver one from all pangs? Prabhupada writes, The narration of the activities of Krishna is like a constant flow of nectar, no one can refuse to drink such nectar except one who is not a human being. Devotional service is the highest goal of life for everyone, and devotional service begins by hearing about the activities of the Lord. Only an animal or a man who is almost an animal can refuse to take such interest in hearing the messages of the Lord. There are many books about the histories in the world, but except for histories of the narrations of the topics of the personality of Godhead, none are capable of diminishing the burden of material pangs. Therefore, one who is serious about eliminating material existence must chant and hear of the transcendental activities of the personality of Godhead. Otherwise, one must be compared to non-humans. Prabhupada said, perhaps in the history of the world, I am the first person who is boldly declaring that people are not humans. He said, well, that's what Yavana Malecha means. You're not a human. You're outside of Vedic culture, so you're subhuman. So these narrations are meant for humans, and if you hear them, then you become a human being. And then, if you hear them enough, one thing Prabhupada said previously in one of the verses, or it was a verse or a purport, um, yes, nothing remains unachieved when the personality of God is displeased with someone. By transcendental achievement, one understands everything else to be insignificant. Yeah, so this is really important. One of the goals is another plug for the Japa workshop in case you're getting your courage up to call your boss. We have about six goals, five or six goals for the workshop. And one of the goals is this, to understand everything else but the holy name is insignificant. That's one of the goals. Because, because when you actually get a taste for the holy name, that taste is so strong and powerful that the consequence or the symptom or the byproduct of that is you start to feel that, as Bhaktivinoda Thakur said, there's nothing else in all the three worlds but the holy name. Would you like to feel that way? Wouldn't that be wonderful? You're chanting, and you're so absorbed in chanting, you feel, this is nothing more than, more, more than this that I want. Just the holy name. It's so much nectar. It's so wonderful. I want nothing but this. Would you like to, to achieve that position? Okay. Sign up on the paper outside the temple room. <laughs> and you'll get it. It's one of the goals. Because otherwise, we don't want to spend the rest of our lives struggling to get a taste to finish our rounds. We don't want to do that. That's not good. It's a sign that there's a problem because the holy name is sweet. And when the holy name is tasted as sweet, also 
Krishna's pastimes, they also become sweet. There is nothing more, nothing else in this, nothing else. You imagine, you, you walk down the street, you don't see anything. There's nothing else. Nothing has any attraction to you. Zero. No attraction. Only the holy name. So that's the symptom of devotional service. If we're properly situated, materially, things become more and more insignificant. And that's how we know whether or not we're advancing. If things become more and more significant, we know there's a problem. But as we, if we see things in this world and we're just losing more and more interest and the things of the transcendental world become more and more attractive, then we know we're advancing. Right? It's built in. You could know immediately. So any of you who would like to get that taste, I invite you to come. If you can't make it, then you can come to Juhu on Friday night, Saturday and Sunday, if you like. But I think coming to the Govardhan Ashram is special. Govardhan Eco Village, special because we'll have kirtan every night also. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. So, we have time for questions, if anyone would like to ask. And then we will do the Brahma Samhita, and then we'll do kirtan. We have time? Yeah, so we could do like 10 minutes of questions, 10 or 15, if you like. We have another microphone. Oh yeah, we have a microphone. So if you have any questions, raise your hand and we'll try to get the microphone to you. What are you thinking? Have you asked questions at less time for kirtan? I think.